sponsored by Incogni. Why does this LED produce a red light, but this one produces a blue light? When we apply a voltage across an LED, it produces light. It all comes from a tiny piece of semiconductor material inside, which is emitting energy as photons. But if we shine a light onto the LED, then we are firing photons back into it. So the process reverses and it will also produce a small voltage. LEDs look something like this. They come in different shapes, colors, and sizes for different applications. LED stands for light emitting diode. We use this symbol in engineering drawings for LEDs. Notice it looks very similar to a diode symbol, except it has these arrows that indicate that light is being emitted. LEDs and diodes both work on the same principle. It's just a semiconductor material in the middle of some electrical connectors. They both emit photons, but only the LED emits photons in the range visible to humans. And that's when the photon has a wavelength of around 400 to 700 nanometers. We perceive different colors depending on the wavelength of the photon in this range. FM radio signal is also a photon wave, but it's around three meters. Wi-Fi signal is smaller at around six centimeters and a medical X-ray is tiny at around 0.01 nanometers. But we can't see any of these because they are outside of our visible spectrum. Have you ever noticed there's an LED in your TV remote? This emits infrared light. The photon has a wavelength typically around 940 nanometers. So humans can't see it. However, you can see it on the camera of your phone. Inside the semiconductor, we just have electrons combining with holes and releasing photons in the process. We will learn how it works in more detail later on in this video. Now, a standard diode uses different materials in its semiconductor layer, which produce photons in the near infrared range. These are absorbed by the casing and converted to heat, so diodes become hot. But LEDs produce very little heat. Unlike traditional incandescent lights, which generate a lot of heat. In this design, the electrons collide with atoms in the filament and these collisions produce heat. The filament heats up so much it produces visible light. LEDs don't need to produce heat to produce light. And so they are much more energy efficient. Most of you will recognize this type of LED, the five millimeter through hole type, but have you ever noticed one side has a flat edge? Tell me what you think this is for in the comment section and I'll give you the answer later on in this video. Through hole LEDs are perfect for learning electronics. We can buy them in bulk very cheaply and I'll leave a link for you in the video description for where you can buy them. These can be inserted into test boards or even soldered into printed circuit boards. We can get smaller three millimeter versions or even larger 10 millimeter versions. Typically they are dome shaped, but there are other shapes available like this square one. We also get SMD type, which stands for surface mount device. These are soldered to circuit boards to allow compact designs. These versions are much smaller. Some like this one are so small, you would need a microscope to solder them. We usually find SMD LEDs used in our light bulbs, this one is actually a blue LED. It just has a layer of yellow phosphorus over it. And that's because the yellow and blue light combined makes a white light. We can also get these very high powered LEDs, which are basically just lots of LEDs packed tightly together and are often used for torches and also floodlights. LEDs can produce such bright lights that we can see them from a great distance. But wait, who is that? Oh no, it's a data broker. He's copying all our online personal information and selling it for a profit. Luckily, our sponsor Incogni will find and remove your information. We all know that when we interact with apps and websites, we give away information like our location history, names and aliases, login credentials, social security number, phone numbers, search history, interests, etc. These are all collected by data brokers to form an extensive profile about you and then sold. For example, banks, credit and investment companies might buy information about your financial status, your background and your employment. Insurance companies might buy information about your health. 
Now, you can manually contact each data broker yourself, or you can use Incogni to automate and track the process for you. You can try it right now, and the first 100 people to use my code, Engineering Mindset, using the link below, will get 60% off. Do check it out, links down below. LEDs come in various different color lenses, but we can also get transparent versions which emit different color lights too. The cases are only colored to make it easy for us to tell what color light will be produced. It's actually just the material inside the semiconductor layer that produces the different colors of light and not the color of the case. We will learn how that works later on in this video. LEDs only illuminate when we connect the anode lead to the positive and the cathode to the negative. Take a blue LED and a three volt coin battery. Notice it only illuminates when connected a certain way. It's easy to identify the correct polarity because the longest lead of the LED is the anode. But what if the LED leads have been trimmed? Well, don't worry, because one side of the LED's case has a flat edge, and this indicates the cathode side. Additionally, inside we can notice that there are two metal plates. The larger plate is the cathode, with SMD LEDs, we find a small dot on the top. Sometimes this is used to indicate the anode, other times this is for the cathode. So you'll have to check the manufacturer's data sheet or test it yourself. In this example, the LED illuminates when the positive is connected to the dot side. On the back, we find a marking, but this again could mean either the anode or cathode. Here we can see the LED illuminates when connected like this. We can manually flash LEDs by using a switch, or we can use a simple circuit like this resistor, capacitor, and transistor circuit to automate this. And here is the schematic for that circuit. But these blinking LEDs will turn on and off by themselves automatically at a certain frequency. There's also these type, which change color by themselves in a fast or slow transition. Inside is a tiny controller that sets the frequency. And here is the schematic for that circuit. Then we have bi-directional LEDs. These can change between two colors. Inside, there are two LEDs connected in opposite ways. So when current flows this way, one LED turns on, and when current flows the other way, the other LED turns on. Only one LED can be turned on at a time. However, we can get these three pin by color type. We can manually switch them between one color, the other color, or both colors together. These have two LEDs inside, but they share a terminal. Then we have four pin RGB LEDs. These have three separate LEDs inside, a red, a green, and a blue. And these all share a terminal. We can activate them separately, two at a time to mix the colors, or all three to make a white light. We can control the voltage and current to each LED to make any color we wish. And here is the schematic for that circuit. Now, if you look closely at your monitor, you can see the same thing is happening here too. Lots of tiny multicolor LEDs. By the way, I've left links for these LEDs in the video description down below. But where have you seen these LEDs used? or where could you use them? Let me know in the comment section down below. If we try to connect this LED to this nine volt battery, it will instantly be destroyed. Inside the LED is a thin wire. The battery will try to push so many electrons through this wire that it just breaks. So we use a resistor to reduce the current of electrons. And you can watch my video on how resistors work to learn more. The resistor removes energy from the circuit to protect the LED. It is literally turning the electrical energy into heat to remove it. The battery is providing 9 volts, the resistor removes around 7 volts, and the LED will remove the remaining 2 volts. The resistor is setting the current for the circuit. We can vary the current to control the brightness of the LED, but when we vary the voltage supply, the current will also vary. The manufacturer's data sheet will tell us the rated voltage and current. This LED is rated for 20 milliamps, but we can go slightly above or below this and it will work fine. 
The lower we go, the dimmer the LED will shine. But if we go too high, the LED will be destroyed. That's why we find LED drivers inside light bulbs and also dedicated units powering strip lighting. This lamp runs off of 230 volts. The rectifier is changing the alternating current into direct current and the capacitor is smoothing this out. This chip is providing a constant current to the LEDs so that they don't flicker. This USB light strip is incredibly simple. The USB port provides a 5 volt rail and a ground rail. Between them is just a resistor and an LED. Each set is connected in parallel, which means we can cut this to almost any length. The more LEDs we remove, the lower the current will be. When we look at an LED, we notice there are two metal leads which connect to the main body. The longest lead is the anode and the shortest lead is the cathode. The body is molded from an epoxy resin. These are often colored just to make it easier to tell what color the LED light will be. On the side of the case is a flat edge. This indicates the cathode side. Looking inside the LED case, we see that both the anode and the cathode leads each have a metal plate at the end, and these are separated by a small gap. The plates stop the leads from turning. The larger plate also indicates the cathode side. On the cathode plate, we typically find a cone shape. Within the cone, we find a small piece of semiconductor material made from a layer of N-type material with a layer of P-type material on top of this. This forms a PN junction. A thin wire then runs between the anode terminal and the P-type material to complete the circuit. When the LED is powered, photons are emitted from the PN junction of the semiconductor, which produces the colored light. The cone shape helps reflect the light out of the top of the LED case. The color of the light depends on the wavelength of the photon being emitted from the semiconductor and that depends on the material being used. Electricity is the flow of electrons. Electrons flow easily through conductors like copper, but they can't flow very easily through insulators like rubber. The N-type layer has lots of free electrons, and the P-type layer is missing some electrons, but it has lots of holes that electrons can go and sit in. Electrons are negatively charged, so the letter N just lets us know which side has a negative charge. As electrons are negative, we consider the holes to be positive, and so we use the letter P. To make the semiconductor for a normal diode, we just use silicon. This has four electrons in its valence shell. The atoms will share these to become stable. So where do the electrons and holes come from? Well, we add some impurities like phosphorus, which has five electrons in its valence shell. These are shared with the silicon atoms, but it will leave one electron spare. This electron is free to move to other atoms, and so this is our N-type layer. For the P-type layer, we add some aluminum, which only has three electrons in the valence shell. It doesn't have enough to share with all of its neighboring atoms, so there will be a hole where an electron can move to. We now have a layer with too many electrons, and also a layer with not enough electrons. This joins to form the PN junction. At this junction, we get a depletion region. Some of the electrons move across to fill the holes, and some of the holes move across. But this will create a barrier with a slightly positively charged region and a slightly negatively charged region. This creates an electric field which prevents more electrons moving across. When we connect a battery, Electrons will flow, and we call this a forward bias. But if the voltage is too small, then we can't break this barrier. With a normal diode, we can see the barrier is around 0.5 to 0.7 volts. This is the minimum voltage required for current to flow. But with a red LED, it's much higher, around 1.7 volts. The manufacturer will provide a chart like this, which shows the forward current at a certain forward voltage. We can see that it starts at around 1.7 volts. And we can see that at two volts, we should see around 20 milliamps of current. In this example, that's exactly what we see. Now, looking at a simple Bohr model of an atom, 
we have the nucleus at the center, which contains all the protons and neutrons. Then we have a number of orbital shells where electrons can sit. Each shell can hold a certain number of electrons, and an electron needs to have a certain energy to be accepted into that shell. The further the distance of the shell, the more energy is required. The outermost shell is the valence band. Just beyond this is the conduction band. Electrons that reach this band can break free from the atom. In a conductor like copper, the conduction band is very close, so the electrons can easily move. But in an insulator like rubber, the conduction band is too far away, so the electrons can't escape. But with a semiconductor like silicon, the conduction band is just a short distance away, so it will act like an insulator, but when we apply a voltage, the electron in the valence shell can break free. In the silicon semiconductor, like a diode, the electron is jumping from the n-type conduction band to the p-type valence band. The valence band has less energy than the conduction band, so the electron needs to lose some energy to be accepted into this lower band. It does that by releasing a photon. In silicon, it needs to lose around 1.1 electron volts to be accepted. The energy of this photon is equal to a wavelength of around 1,127 nanometers. And I'll show you how to calculate that in just a moment. That means that silicon diodes emit near-infrared light, which humans can't see. Aww. So instead of silicon, scientists mix gallium and arsenic to form the semiconductor. Then they add some impurities to this to form the n-type and the p-type layers. This semiconductor has a larger band gap of around 1.424 electron volts, and this produces an 870 nanometer wavelength, which is better, but still too high. Then they tried gallium phosphide, which has a band gap of 2.26 electron volts, and this results in a wavelength of 548 nanometers which is perfect because the human eye can see this, and we see this as green. So then scientists realize that by blending the mixture of gallium arsenic with gallium phosphide, they could achieve any color between these two points. So if we mixed 60% gallium arsenic with 40% gallium phosphide, we would get around 1.7 electron volts. We can convert that to a wavelength using this formula. So we drop these numbers in to get this equation. And this gives us a wavelength of around 705 nanometers, which produces a red light. So if we mixed 15% gallium arsenic with 85% gallium phosphide, then this would give us 2.13 electron volts, which is a wavelength of 580 nanometers, and this would give us yellow. So by mixing different materials together to form the semiconductor, this will create different colored lights. Once red, green, and blue could be produced, we can mix these colors to produce any color we need, including white light. And when white light was possible, LED bulbs became widely used. Don't forget, click the link down below and the first 100 people to use my code will get 60% off Incogni. Check out one of the videos on screen now to continue learning about electronics engineering, and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, and theengineeringmindset.com.